This is a lie. The period we now consider to be the Old West took place between the years of 1865 and 1895. It was a period of lawlessness, of fortune seekers, and Western expansion. Perhaps no period of American history has been romanticized like the Old West. It speaks to our core values of rugged individualism and manifest destiny immortalized in countless books and movies. And perhaps nothing says Old West like tumbleweeds. Tumbleweeds have just become a shorthand in movies and TV as a visual way to indicate that you're in the West, or at least parodying the Western. Hello. <laughs> Who are you? I am a simple tumbleweed. But here's the thing. Tumbleweeds aren't native to the U.S. They're not native to anywhere in North America, for that matter. They're actually from Russia. And they didn't show up in the U.S. until 1880, meaning that for more than half of what we consider to be the Old West, tumbleweeds weren't a thing. There are actually far more tumbleweeds around today than there ever were in the days of Jesse James and Billy the Kid. In fact, there's actually too many of them today. Tumbleweed swarms have blocked traffic, swallowed up houses, even buried entire neighborhoods. And they've now mutated into mega tumbleweeds that grow up to five meters tall. Yeah, five to seven meters tall and covered in sharp spikes and thorns, just for fun. Imagine one of those things tumbling into you. Not to mention that these mountains of dead, dry balls of tinder can turn a small wildfire into a freaking nightmare. So how did this Russian weed turn into a symbol of the American Old West? How do we keep it from destroying us? I'll be honest, I wanted to start this video with an animation of two tumbleweeds squaring off outside a saloon and then, and then a cowboy rolls by. We didn't pull it off, but I still felt like it was an idea worth mentioning. Anyway, in October of 1880, a package arrived at the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. In the package was a report documenting a strange plant that had appeared in newly tilled land in South Dakota. Included in the report was a sample of this mystery plant from near the town of Yankton on the Missouri River. The people at the Department of Agriculture said, neat, and then just unceremoniously filed it away. But this was the first known report of tumbleweeds in the U.S. And for 10 years or so after that, that was about it. But after a while, many more samples started showing up. One came from Aberdeen, about 322 kilometers north of Yankton, another came from North Dakota. Next thing you know, tumbleweeds have become so widespread that one legislator in the 1890s even proposed building a giant fence to corral them. But by that point, they had tumbled their way into Canada. As for how they got here in the first place, most people believe that they arrived in South Dakota sometime in the 1870s, likely in a flaxseed shipment because we were importing flax from Russia at the time. And they knew fairly early on that this was from Russia. It's actually called Russian thistle, although Russians called them Perikati Pole, which means to roll across the field. Pretty much sums it up. In fact, because of course there's always some xenophobia involved, some farmers back then actually blamed Russian Mennonites in the area, uh, actually accusing them of intentionally spreading these tumbleweeds as revenge of some sort. And the more anti-Semitic farmers, of course, blamed Russian Jews, though most of them were in New York at the time. But those were scattered cases. For the most part, there was nothing controversial or iconic about these tumbleweeds. Nobody seemed to care about them. They didn't symbolize anything. They were just annoying plants. Then Buffalo Bill came to town. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. Nope, not that one. Not that Buffalo Bill. I'm talking about Buffalo Bill Cody. William Frederick Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill, was basically a Western version of P.T. Barnum a consummate showman who toured the East Coast with his immensely popular Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Technically, it was called Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and Congress of Rough Riders of the World. It features sharpshooters, singing, dancing, circus acts, live buffalo, displays of horsemanship from all around the world, and even reenactments of frontier battles and stories from his life. He employed dozens of Native American performers, and while his portrayal of the Native Americans were stereotypical and inaccurate, probably wouldn't fly today, it was actually pretty progressive at the time. Um, he wanted his audience to see them as, as people, to see how the natives lived, what their families were like, not just, you know, represent them as savages. And he actually advocated for native sovereignty, saying, quote, Every Indian outbreak that I have ever known has resulted from broken promises and broken treaties by the government. But he was also a showman who made everything bigger than life. Including a part in his show where he reenacted on stage the first time he scalped an Indian. So. Yeah. 
But it's hard to overstate just how popular this traveling show was in the days before movies and TV. This was the thing when the show came through town. Buffalo Bill was like the Taylor Swift of his day. And people back east have been hearing all these tales from the frontier, the, the Wild West, it was all over the newspapers and then the books of the day. And then Buffalo Bill came through town and just put it right in front of them. So yeah, they just, they came out in droves. They could see with their own eyes these, these cowboys and gunslingers and animals and plants. Yeah, as part of his sort of Wild West world building, Buffalo Bill would dress up his shows with tumbleweeds. Uh, granted, they were still kind of brand new in that part of the world, but maybe he thought that roaming tumbleweeds were an apt metaphor for the freedom of the Wild West. Actually, an early promotional pamphlet for the show in 1883 described them almost exactly that way. It's a, they described the tumbleweeds as a Western symbol. So yeah, that was kind of just a trope that he created, but, but that was one of many tropes that he created that became just completely ingrained in the minds of people all over the U.S. Um, in Europe, actually. He, he toured there a couple of times. He even performed for Queen Victoria and Kaiser Wilhelm II. God, guy had a crazy life. Larry McMurtry once claimed that at the turn of the century, Buffalo Bill was the most recognizable celebrity on Earth. That's the kind of reach this guy had. But in the 1910s, his show kind of fizzled out, and he eventually died in 1917. But in the decades following his death, as moving pictures became popular, those tropes that he had created and spread all around the world, they found a new home in Westerns. As historian John William Nelson told Texas Monthly in 2021, quote, Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show is basically the proto-Western. When the film comes along, those become the kind of scenes that morph into what we think of as a Western now. Hence, tumbleweeds. The tumbleweed can represent the drifter, moving wherever the wind takes him. It can also represent the wildness of the story about to unfold. It can also indicate location, the West, specifically California. You see one and you automatically know you're in the land of cowboys, gunfights, and miles of dusty lands. In 1935, the movie Tumbling Tumbleweeds featured the song Tumbling Tumbleweeds by the Sons of the Pioneers. Drifting along with a tumbling tumbleweeds. A song that's never quite left our social memory. Drifting along with the tumbling tumbleweeds. Yeah, I went back and watched City Slickers fairly recently, and uh, the, the main character, Billy Crystal's character, he's going through this midlife crisis, and uh, he's, he's younger in the movie than I am now, so that, that feels good. Anyway, so that's how Tumbleweeds became, like, Tumbleweeds, the American icon. Um, but as I say at the beginning of this video, it's starting to take on a new persona. That of a dangerous invasive species. So when they pile up in these giant mountains of tumbleweeds, they can easily spark a new fire, or they can significantly add to an existing fire. But maybe even worse, because they're made to roll and travel, they're the perfect vehicles to spread the fire. For example, wildfires. We've been having wildfires all over the place lately. Well, tumbleweeds are easily flammable. They're so flammable that there is a type of fire starter for grills called tumbleweeds. Often a flaming tumbleweed can just jump over fire barriers or, or get caught up in an updraft and land hundreds of meters away, starting a whole new fire in a whole new spot. And even when they're not in flames, they can bounce across highways, scratch the hell out of cars, they can pile up and cause traffic problems. In fact, on New Year's Eve in 2019, five cars and an 18-wheeler got trapped by a pile of tumbleweeds that were up to 4.6 meters tall. That's 15 feet tall. It took another 10 hours to get the pile up cleaned up and get the traffic going again. And in April of 2018, strong winds blew hundreds of tumbleweeds into a neighborhood northeast of Los Angeles. They piled so high that they reached the second floors of buildings and blocked entrances to about 100 homes. It literally smothered an entire neighborhood, and it took two days to clear them out. But why are these tumbleweeds so dangerous? Um, it might help to get to the bottom of the biology of the tumbleweed to get an answer to that. So its scientific name is Salsola tragus, but it goes by Russian thistle, Russian cactus, and also wind witch. Wind Witch sounds like a badass name for a metal band. This Sunday at the Poughkeepsie Civic Center, Tokamak and Stellarator featuring Wind Witch. Ages nine and up. Anyway, despite the names, uh, it's actually not a thistle or a cactus or a witch. Uh, it's actually part of the amaranth family. Amaranths include plants like beet, chard, salt bush, and spinach. Their main superpower is that it's really good at exploiting loose or disturbed soil where there isn't any other vegetation. That's what made the Great Plains the perfect place for it to spread, because when farmers cut down prairie grasses and other vegetation so they could plant their crops, they created a good home for Russian thistle. The plant starts off as a soft seedling that grows more woody and stiff and spiny as it matures, eventually growing into a large round bush. By the way, at this stage of its life cycle, it's actually edible, and was often used to feed livestock, and some versions of it were even made into stews in the Great Depression. 
And just like other plants, it eventually flowers and grows seeds. Uh, a lot of seeds, actually. Larger plants can produce up to 250,000 seeds. And then, just like the other plants, it has to spread those seeds. And nature's come up with lots of ways for plants to disperse of their seeds. Some use other animals, like birds. Uh, some make the seeds kind of aerodynamic to catch a breeze and float them along. What the Russian thistle does is it dies. Beginning in the late fall, the thistle dries out and dies. A cluster of cells at the base of the bush grow together and it cuts off the water supply to the rest of the plant, eventually forming a weak spot at the base. With all the water removed from the plant, it now becomes very lightweight and its large surface area catches as much of the wind as possible until it breaks off at that weak spot and it goes a-tumbling. For a tumbleweed, death is just the beginning. And as we've seen, the wind blows the thistle far and wide, every bounce knocking more of those 200,000 plus seeds onto the ground and the whole cycle starts up again when the rains come and it opens those seeds up. This has proven to be an extremely effective survival strategy, especially on certain types of dry, flat landscapes like the Russian steppes and the American West. But we've also done a lot as people to help them spread. I mean, the fact that they're in the United States at all is people spreading it. So yeah, since its seeds are about the same size as other cereal grains, it was really difficult to separate them out mechanically. So these Russian thistle seeds would contaminate grain shipments. And then thanks to the railroad, they were able to spread hundreds of miles with little effort. Oh, and they could also float along canals and ditches, which helped them spread. And because of all that spreading, we're now seeing all these problems I was talking about earlier. By the way, if you're hearing me talk about this, you know, really dangerous invasive species that's swallowing up whole neighborhoods, and you're thinking to yourself, wow, this can't possibly get any worse. Well, you haven't been awake during the 2020s, have you? Things only get worse. Let me introduce you to Salsola Riani, also known as monster tumbleweed. This is a hybrid tumbleweed that starts, starts at two meters high. That's six feet for you imperialists. It popped up fairly recently and at first scientists were hoping that it might just, you know, die out, but much like that dorky photo of you from middle school that you thought you deleted from your MySpace account, it seems here to stay. A study published in AOB Plants in February 2020 explains that this new species is a hybrid with doubled pairs of its parents' chromosomes. This causes it to grow much bigger than regular tumbleweeds. As the study co-author Norman Elstrand says, quote, Salsola riani is a nasty species replacing other nasty species of tumbleweeds in the U.S. One other reason it tends to grow big is that it grows on the later side of winter. Uh, this means it's still green in the summer and can take advantage of summer rains. All of which means bigger tumbleweeds, bigger piles of tumbleweeds, and on top of all of that, it's also destroying our soil. According to a study in 2004, tumbleweeds may be what they call a cadmium hyperaccumulating species. This means that the plant prefers to take up cadmium from the soil and it keeps it in its leaves and stems. Of course, it then blows away, taking it away from that soil. It also can remove high levels of oxalates from the soil, all of which depletes the soil of nutrients and makes crops even harder to grow. So, what can we do about this? Certain herbicides are effective against them, but there are more sustainable ways to minimize their damage as well. For one, you can just stamp them out before the seeds start to spread. If you live somewhere that has a lot of tumbleweeds, just, you gotta just pull them from the ground, man. And you gotta make sure you get all the plant, including the seeds, but be careful, wear protective gloves because tumbleweeds have very sharp points. They'll just, just shred you right off there. Some farmers are exploring a variety of biocontrols to get rid of them. These include things like mites, two moth species that apparently attack tumbleweeds, a stem boring insect, a defoliating insect, and two fungus species. Those two fungus species, by the way, they were found on infected thistle plants in Hungary and Russia, and scientists were able to isolate them, and now they're using that to help control the tumbleweeds here in the U.S. So, yeah, bringing in a foreign species to help fight a foreign species. What could go wrong? Hopefully nothing this time, but our track record on these things has not been great. Like in the 1930s when they were trying to control pests in sugarcane fields, so they brought in cane toads from South America and just kind of let them loose in Florida. I've talked about this before, cane toads became a very invasive species. There's now thousands of them all over the state, which wouldn't be a problem, except for the fact that they're highly toxic. Yeah, they're a real threat to any local animals that may try to eat them, and that includes pets. So don't let your dog eat a cane toad. It, it will, it, it, yeah, you'll, it'll kill your dog. They, of course, also compete with native frogs and toads for food and breeding areas and whatnot. Now, another invasive plant species in the south is kudzu. It's a vine native to China and Japan and was brought over to the U.S. in 1876 for decorative purposes, which it has now decorated the entire South. It's actually called the vine that ate the South. 
It grows at a rate of 0.3 meters or around a foot per day. And it just overtakes everything in sight from native grasses to mature trees. And once it completely engulfs a tree or a whole forest of trees, it blocks the sunlight and then the tree dies underneath it. Which is bad enough, but of course those aren't just trees, they're whole ecosystems for animals and insects, so there's a big domino effect that happens. So you got the kudzu swallowing up all the trees in the south, and the tumbleweed swallowing neighborhoods in the west. Maybe someday they'll go to war with each other over control of America. Whoever wins, we all lose. But yeah, tumbleweeds. Barely even existed during the Old West. Way over exists now. But you know, it really is amazing how much we think that we know about the years past that has just been completely made up by pop culture. Like, when I went down that Victorian rabbit hole a little while back, it kind of hit me that the Victorian age happened at the same time period as the Old West. So all those famous outlaws were just frontier Victorians. All those gunfights in front of saloons were just arguments over arsenic-laced wallpaper and cocaine toothache drops. Anyway, I hope that you found tumbleweeds as surprisingly interesting as I did, and if you learned something and you enjoy learning things, you might want to check out today's sponsor, Brilliant. Okay, now wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I know you're about to click away, but don't. Just, just hang on. My sponsor reads are funny as hell. I don't just phone in my reads. I earn my money, son. So Brilliant's a learning platform. Yes, you, you know this. But if you haven't tried Brilliant yet, you might not know that it's, it's also kind of a game. Like, I've been trying to get into gaming recently. I've never really been a gamer. But one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of gaming is just problem solving. Just, you know, just figuring things out. And the thing is, that's exactly what Brilliant does. It just hacks that little mechanism that gives your brain happy juice whenever you solve a problem in a game. Because that's how it works. You're not being asked to memorize a bunch of numbers and formulas. You're just solving problems. And that helps you to remember it. Like, think about how much time you invest in problem solving in games just to finish the game. Now imagine that when you get to the end, you know advanced calculus, or orbital mechanics, or neural networks, or probability. You just collect them like power stones snap away half the universe. No, don't, don't, don't use Brilliant to dust away half the universe. We at Answers with Joe do not support Thanosism. Brilliant's courses feature interactive lessons that start you with the very basics and walk you through your subjects, problem solving as you go, until you're brainifying things you never thought you'd ever brainificate. And yes, there is an app for your phone, so again, all that time that you're spending breaking blocks and angering birds, you could be learning a valuable skill. So, if you want to give it a try, just click the link down below or go to brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe. You'll get the first 30 days for free so you can try it out, and the first 200 that sign up will get 20% off after that. And look, if all those numbers are confusing to you, then you probably need Brilliant more than you think. Now, Brilliant is awesome, and they've been a great supporter of this channel all this time, so I really do appreciate them. That's brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe. Go check it out and get Brilliant. All right, thanks for watching and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to keep the lights on around here, supporting financially, also just forming a really awesome community. Uh, they, I, they fact check my videos and they're a great repository of information that I can always go back to and I really appreciate them. So we got some new patrons for me to shout out real quick. We've got Joe Grossel, Eric Smalling, a name in Greek that I cannot read. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's Josh Tuna. Uh, Ronnie Carlson, Harnold, Jeff Riddle, Bart Black, Nadu Cody, and Fruit of the Moon. Nice. Uh, thank you guys so much for doing that. Um, if you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, Zoom calls, and to just be a part of a, an awesome community and a Discord as well, uh, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Um, I think I have one on the cane toads that I talked about before. Maybe I'll remember to put that there. Uh, or look on the sidebar if you're on your browser, any of those thumbnails that have my name on them, give them a click. And if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. Cool guys, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.